In 2019, Dr. Hazan saw an 82-year-old man who suffered from a recurrent gut infection with the pathogen Clostridium difficile. The most effective treatment for Clostridium difficile infections is a so-called stool transplant, where the microbiome from a healthy person is transferred to a sick one. Dr. Hazan administered the transplant, which was successful in curing the man's infection. However, about two months after the procedure, his wife called, because she noticed something weird. Over the last five years, her husband's memory has gradually deteriorated and he was eventually classified with Alzheimer's disease. Before the microbiota transplant, he was unable to remember his daughter's birthday. Shortly after the transplant, however, he was able to remember it again, and his wife reported on astonishing improvements in his memory, cognition and mood. At his most recent mini mental state examination, the man scored a 20. The score ranges from 0 to 30 and everything below 24 is considered cognitively impaired. The test was redone two months after the stool transplant and the man scored a 26 and a few months later a 29, indicating normal cognition. We don't know exactly what caused and later reversed the man's Alzheimer's, but the answer seems to be somewhere hidden within the billions of microbes that inhabit the human gut and we collectively call the gut microbiota. The number of gut bacteria alone outnumber our own cells. They can use dietary compounds we are unable to process and produce molecules that interact with our own cells. You may have heard of the saying, you are what you eat. A more accurate statement here would be to say, you are what your microbes eat. Everyone has a different, very unique set of microbes, with lifestyle, diet and genetics being the main drivers of the microbiome composition. However, even though the microbiome is different from person to person, people with diseases often show extreme abnormalities in their microbiome composition, also called a gut dysbiosis. Interestingly, a study published in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease found that the gut microbiota is altered in patients with Alzheimer's disease. Molecules produced by the microbiome are not only affecting our digestive system, but can act as signals to the immune system, to the brain and other organs. The signaling between the GI tract and our nervous system is called the gut-brain axis and is one of the fastest growing research areas nowadays. While curing Alzheimer's with stool transplant sounds like a once in a lifetime success story, it isn't a total exception. We know for a few years now that children with autism have a distinct microbiome composition and that their microbes produce different molecules when compared to children who develop normal. Older studies and case reports even suggest that autism often starts after children have been treated with antibiotics, which later led to the development of gut infections with bacteria of the genus Clostridium, the same class of pathogens that requires a stool transplant for the man with Alzheimer's. There is only one known antibiotic that is temporarily effective against Clostridium bacteria, called vancomycin. In fact, a small study including 10 children with autism found that 8 children significantly improved during vancomycin treatment. This was also true for Andrew Balti, who developed normal until he received 6 courses of antibiotics due to a misdiagnosed ear infection. While still on antibiotics, Andrew's behavior changed. He became completely withdrawn and his symptoms even remained after the antibiotics were stopped. Andrew was eventually classified as severely autistic and showed symptoms like toe walking and avoiding eye contact. As for the 8 children from the study I just mentioned, vancomycin treatment improved Andrew's symptoms. Unfortunately, this wasn't the end of the story. When vancomycin treatment was stopped, all children, including Andrew, relapsed. This was enough evidence though for a research group from the Arizona State University to set up a trial using a microbiome transfer therapy. The therapy involved two weeks of antibiotic treatment to kill off potential harmful bacteria combined with a bowel cleanse, followed by a stool transplant daily for eight weeks. What sounds extreme was simply the researcher's way to ensure proper replacement of any unhealthy microbes with normal healthy ones. Before the treatment, more than 80% of children were classified severely autistic. Directly after the procedure, most children improved, and a two-year follow-up showed that now more than 40% of the children had minimal to no symptoms anymore. 
We don't know the cause of autism yet, but we know that certain Clostridium species produce neurotoxins which are transported via the vagus nerve to the brain. One target of these toxins are neurons that release gamma aminobutyric acid, or short GABA. GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter that has relaxing and anti-anxiety effects. A toxin that reduces GABA levels may lead to neurons that are constantly firing, and this could overwhelm the developing brain of children. Because of GABA's anti-anxiety effects, it has also been implicated in depression. Patients who suffer from major depressive disorders show reduced brain concentrations of GABA. At this point, it is important to mention that GABA and other neurotransmitters can also be produced directly by certain gut microbes. These microbes can produce GABA. And these produce dopamine, which motivates us to do things. These microbes produce norepinephrine, the neurotransmitter for arousal and alertness. And these produce serotonin, which regulates many bodily processes ranging from mood to intestinal movements. Sure, whatever is produced in the gut does not necessarily reach the brain and has the same effect as self-made, locally produced molecules. Having said this though, I want to point out that it is estimated that more than 90% of our total serotonin is located in cells lining the gut, and they likely rely on molecules produced by gut microbes. Some of these neurotransmitters are also dysregulated in depression, which makes researchers think that therapies targeting the microbiome may be effective in treating depression. Remember the man from the beginning who got his Alzheimer's reversed via stool transfer? During his gradual cognitive decline, he also developed depression. However, shortly after the transfer, he and his wife reported a marked improvement in mood. Again, this connection is not an exception. A study published in the journal GUT found that people with depression show an increase in intestinal permeability and higher blood LPS levels. LPS stands for lipopolysaccharide and is a molecule that sits on the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria and is a potent stimulator of inflammation that can cause all kinds of diseases, including neurological disorders. If you type into PubMed, LPS and depression, you get more than 1700 results. If you type in LPS and Alzheimer's, you get more than 800 results. And if you type in LPS and Parkinson's, you get more than 600 results. I think you get the point. LPS does not cause excessive inflammation when it is contained inside the gut, but many studies now show that neurological diseases often correlate with increased gut permeability. As an example, a study found that 73% of patients with Alzheimer's disease have increased gut permeability. Okay, but how could a molecule produced by bacteria and recognized by immune cells in the gut possibly reach the brain? Didn't we learn that the blood-brain barrier prevents any potential harmful substances from entering the brain? As Caltech researcher Sarkis Masmanian explains in his TED talk, we learned that many of these molecules that are altered in the gut microbiomes of children with autism and in the mice cross the blood-brain barrier and actually change the way neurons and other cells function. This rewiring of the brain by gut microbial molecules led to the hallmark symptoms of autism. In fact, a study published by him and 23 other scientists showed that treatment of an ASD mouse model with candidate microbial metabolites improves behavioral abnormalities. They did this by simply adding these microbial metabolites to the drinking water of mice. Let's stick with inflammation for a moment. Even though we haven't figured out efficient ways to treat depression or other neurological diseases, we are surprisingly good in inducing them. Injections with the inflammatory cytokine interferon alpha is the standard treatment for hepatitis C infections. But there's a trade-off. About 40% of patients treated with interferon alpha suffer from a full-blown major depression. However, by reducing inflammation with anti-inflammatory omega-3 fatty acids, the incidence of depression was reduced by about 66%. Considering what we just have learned, I guess it's not too surprising that people who suffer from inflammatory bowel disease have an increased risk in developing neurological disorders later in life including Parkinson's disease. Another interesting observation is that 80% of patients with Parkinson's have gastrointestinal problems, particularly constipation, 
and this often precedes the onset of the disease by many years. In fact, a big meta-analysis that looked at risk factors for Parkinson's found constipation to be one of the biggest risk factors. Patients with Parkinson's also show a different microbiome composition. One study found a 78% reduction in the abundance of bacteria from the Provotilaceae family in Parkinson patients. This family of gut bacteria is related to high levels of anti-inflammatory short-chain fatty acids and can produce vitamins like vitamin B1 and folate. For now it is difficult to pinpoint one single bacteria or one single molecule as a cause of a disease, and it may likely be the combination of many including increased gut permeability, chronic inflammation, a dysregulation of neurotransmitters, or a reduction in short-chain fatty acids and vitamins. However, researchers like Dr. Masmanian are coming closer by performing experiments like the following. We were able to prove that gut bacteria are involved in the disease process. The experiment that we performed was quite simple. We took mice engineered to have symptoms of Parkinson's, and we removed all of their gut bacteria and all their symptoms were gone. Then, we added back certain microbial molecules to these disease-free mice, and their symptoms came back. Understanding what specific microbe or microbial molecule contributes to a certain disease has the potential to change medicine as we know it. Stool transplants seem to be a promising strategy, but they do bear some risks. Replacing your own microbiome with a foreign microbiome can also introduce pathogens that have been overlooked in the screening process. This can be especially dangerous for immunocompromised people who suffer from chronic illnesses or are on chemotherapy. This simply underlines the need for more research. However, even if we can ensure that a stool transplant is 100% safe, most people with minor gut issues or mood swings wouldn't necessarily consider a transplant, as the thought of receiving somebody else poop doesn't sound very enticing. Therefore, other means of changing the microbiome are currently explored, like the intake of probiotics and prebiotics, or different kinds of diet interventions. And the results look promising so far. Researchers from the UK compiled data from all studies that have previously looked at whether probiotics or prebiotics can improve depression and anxiety, and found that every study demonstrated a significant, quantitatively evident, decrease slash improvement of symptoms and or biochemical relevant measures of anxiety and or depression for probiotic or combined prebiotic and probiotic use. And this seems to be not only the case for depression, but also for other neurological diseases like Alzheimer's. As one study recently published found that supplementation with Bifidobacterium brevi for 16 weeks significantly improved memory and cognitive functions in people with mild cognitive impairment. Probiotics are certainly not a magic pill, but they seem to help in certain situations. The point of this video is not to downplay the complexity of neurological diseases, but to show you that, at least in some cases, we should look to the gut rather than the brain to understand neurological diseases. After all, Hippocrates was probably right when he said, all disease begins in the gut. A lot of information for this video came from Dr. Permutter's book Brain Maker and Dr. Bradison's book The End of Alzheimer's, as well as other podcasts I will link in the description. Thank you for watching.